has been in the last 50 or 60 years. In the 1950s, <coughs> roughly around the time some of us were born, Dr. Evelyn Hooker in the United States managed to break the then ordinary opinion, which is that there were certain particular psychological configurations that went along with being a homosexual. Very long journey, of course, trying to reconcile uh, being out and being relaxed and attempting, attempting to hold together in one, in one life person, in one life story, things that for many generations have been regarded as completely incompatible. Um, so, you know, this is, is part of being a generation where these things are now being able to be lived together bearably in a way that just hasn't been true before. It certainly wasn't true for me at an earlier stage. Uh, so, I guess that, you know, we become we become symptoms of uh, uh, of something that's going on uh, that's, as I say, that's wider than us and bigger than us. And, and if we think of the strides that have been made in the 50 years, 60 years since then, in the realisation that we are dealing with that ultimate banal reality, a non-pathological minority variant in the human condition. Nothing more, nothing less. <laughs> if something is a non-pathological, minor regularly occurring minority variant, at least it becomes possible to ask, well in that case, what's it for? <laughs> Where is it tending? Is it automatically, as it would have to be if it were a defect from something, uh, a source of self-destruction, a source of anti-flourishing, if you like, in the life of a person? Um, or is it a place from which flourishing uh, can happen, uh, as it were, as a development organically out of itself rather than despite itself? Uh, and this is what we appear to be learning, is that uh, if what we're talking about in the life of this pretty small but regularly occurring <laughs> non-pathological minority variant of the evolution is that when those people are allowed to live honestly, live honestly, when they're allowed to develop relationships and forms of togetherness that are at least analogous to those with, uh, that other humans uh, enjoy, then this leads not only to their flourishing but to the flourishing of their neighbours and those with whom they associate and it enables, it encourages them in their professional development and so on and so forth. In other words, the question is not only the scientific, the empirical question, is being gay a defect? <laughs> But it's more than that, it's what is the becoming of this thing over time? If you like, that's the Catholic question. Non-pathological minority variant of the human condition. Furthermore, a regularly occurring non-pathological minority variant of the human condition. Even more banal. <laughs> oh, we are, we report twice, we were so special, now we know what 3.7% of the population in all cultures. <laughs> what will I do in Antarctica? <laughs> It's the same, it's the same everywhere. Now, this has much bigger consequences than we might think. It's the old official position, and I should say this was an official position that was common pretty much across the board, was that however you like to define it, uh, homosexuality is some or other form of either pathology or vice. <laughs> it's either a physiological or psychological defect or it's uh, uh, the sign of a dissolute life, if you like. Uh, well, neither of those is defensible any longer. But therefore, the moral question has to be asked anew. Okay, if it isn't those things, obviously it can't be judged as if it were one of those things. So the whole notion of the only response to it is one of absolute prohibition. That lapses. And indeed, the Vatican's own teaching makes that clear. The absolute prohibition is linked to the definition uh, uh, of being gay as a, an objective disorder. So the moment you see that the objective disorder description doesn't work any longer, you have to say, okay, what's this for? What's the shape of flourishing? And I think that that's, if you like, the really new, the new question, uh, because we're not talking about how do we cope, how do we survive despite this thing? We're saying, what's this for? And of course, that's a much more open-ended question. It's a much more creative question. For many of us, this has been a, a deeply discombobulating <coughs> change because we've stopped being anaesthetized against the pain of what I would call the Stockholm Syndrome. 
if you're brought up, in a, brought up in a really oppressive regime where you're not allowed to be who you are, you get used to it pretty damn quick for reasons of survival. Your feelings close down and you get used to backing up the system against yourself. I just think how many of us have done that, how successfully, for how long? And in fact, how often? That's an <coughs> ordinary part of the life of many of us. You know. Passing and backing up the system because it seems to be safer than heading into the strange, strange, painful place of us not being anything at all. Better a system of rules that hates you than nothing at all. The last, the last few years have been very rich in ordinary Catholics of a profoundly obedient and docile disposition all across the church in all the countries of which I have acquaintance, finding themselves in crisis with relation to their way of belonging to the church, not because they have suddenly turned bad, but because the whole carapace, if you like, of the institution has turned out to be much more creaky <laughs> than anybody had thought. And this is because of various forms of learning, various forms of understanding that have simply percolated through over time, that we are simply aware of. Uh, it's these that have put the, uh, the institution into crisis, in other words. <laughs> um, what I hope I'm doing, rather than provoking this crisis, is attempting to give people the, the means to, 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 surf the, to surf the waves uh, uh, that are being provoked, because that seems to me to be the only way to remain a faithful Catholic and say, okay, this is, as so many periods of church history, this is a period of enormous change. Uh, there, are, there are two, uh, it seems to me, to be hopeless reactions to that. One is, batten down the hatches, nothing changes, and the other is, this uh, body is such a, uh, an awful body that it's better to leave it and try to start something else. Those two seem to be really equal and opposite <laughs> reactions, both of which deny the reality, which is that what we're talking about is undergoing uh, the groaning of the birth of the new creation, and that this is what it looks like. You have to do that patiently over time. Um, so, uh, if I'm doing that badly, if, it, if it's me that's stirring up trouble, then I'm doing something wrong. If the trouble is stirring independently of me, <laughs> then pointing to it and attempting to talk about it rationally does not seem to be an entirely awful thing to do. Jesus is teaching about forgiving our enemies, praying, praying for those who persecute you, was not because Jesus wants us, us, wants us as a doormat. It's don't let the bastards run you. The only way that you're going to be free is by being big enough to let go. That's how you're not going to be run. Forgiveness is a very practical matter. <laughs> it's how not to be run by the evil that is done to you. It was something that built up over about a year and a half. Um, actually had a very positive effect on me in that it was what enabled me very clearly to see for the first time that this, this, uh, this hatred this is a purely human mechanism. <laughs> this hatred, this uh, anxiety, if you like, about gay people is a purely human mechanism has nothing whatever to do with God. And I guess that if I hadn't undergone that, I wouldn't have, uh, I wouldn't have experienced that quite so cleanly. Uh, there, was, there was something very clean about the realization, oh, it's not me that they're against. There's nothing to do with God in this. This is a human mechanism of, of violence and scapegoating, in which I'm pretty incidental. I'm a cardboard cutout, really. And, <laughs> um, and that's actually set me free to think uh, uh, to dissociate even in, you know, in the depths of my, uh, of my heart, uh, God, from any sort of involvement in this violence. I think that for many uh, gay believers that's an, important, uh, that's an important moment when they actually realize that, that all the things that they slightly fear about God because of what they've heard from the religious things are false. <laughs> that God doesn't have wrath towards gay people. <laughs>